Mr. Turner, thank you so much for delivering the opening keynote for our conference this year. In thank you, Brian. It was my honor. Very pleasure to have you. Your topic was the U.S. economy and what it means for businesses, small businesses. Um, and, and you talked about some pretty, not difficult things, but real things with challenges in the economy. Um, hit some of the high points of, of what you delivered today in your opening keynote. I think uh, the fact, the message was, is that the world is changing. Um, the position of the U.S. in that world economy is dramatically changing. It does create some tremendous challenges for the country, which I think with the right leadership the country can deal with, but absent some very significant, very painful changes, uh, it's going to be a very tough road to hoe for the U.S. economy, given where we're at these days. Some of those tough changes you talked about um, were being responsible personally and, and not really wanting to, to lay blame on necessarily the legislatures, the legislators, those in, in elected office who are in charge of our budgeting and, and, and spending, um, and tr also trying to consider uh, the responsibility to help them as the U.S. public make the right choices. Um, what are some of the tough choices that you see need to be made or considered? Well, <clears throat> currently, every, as everyone knows, um, the revenues and the spending are uh, out of whack in the U.S. with us taking in about $2.2 trillion a year in revenues and spending $3.5, $3.6 trillion. So obviously there's an unbalanced budget, if you will. And we've got to find a way to get that back in balance and then pay off some of the debt that we've run up during the last decade. And it's not just the federal government, as we talked about this morning. Uh, certainly the federal government ran up a lot of debt. Uh, individual households, though, uh, percentage-wise, ran up just as much debt. Uh, there's probably some irresponsibility on their part. Uh, the financial services sector of our economy uh, ran up uh, even more, significantly more debt than either the federal government or households did, but business in general uh, did too. And so now we've got to find the cash resources to pay down that debt. And usually uh, that means people need to tighten their belts, mm -hmm. find a way to do it. Uh, but people also got to be willing to pay for the services that they want and being be willing to uh, uh, make the contributions that are necessary uh, to make that uh, occur. You talked a little bit too about the debt on the books and the debt not on the books that our government <coughs> is looking to balance. Um, discuss some of those issues there and how it plays into um, impacting the overall economy. Yeah, today uh, the numbers that are often cited, there's about 14.2 trillion official debt uh, nine to ten trillion of that is debt held by the public. That's all on on the balance sheet, the financial statements of the U.S. government. But there's another uh, thirty, forty. Uh, I think the the closest calculation by the GAO is actually forty three trillion in obligations that we owe under Social Security, Medicare, uh, Medicaid to literally tens of millions of Americans. That number has been growing three to four trillion a year, which uh, is a multiple higher, a significant multiple higher than the 1.2 to 1.5 trillion in just the annual spending deficit. And so this off balance sheet obligation for the Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid is by far and away the biggest draw in the cash mm -hmm. of the country that there is unless the American public is willing to accept changes to those programs, there is literally no way to fix the overall uh, U.S. budget. If you say those programs are off the table and can't be changed, mm -hmm. uh, some also argue defense can't be cut, and throw in the interest that you owe, 
which has to be paid or you go into default and we have huge problems, that only leaves you 31% of the total budget to deal with. Mm -hmm. You could wipe out 100% of that 31% of the budget left over that you could touch and it still wouldn't eliminate the current deficit. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit too about our relationship to China and their um, growing economy and our dependency, our relationship with them. Um, pretty fascinating um, points you brought up. Discuss with us a little bit about where we are currently with them and looking forward to the next few decades, how that balance and relationship to the world economy will start to change. Yeah, uh, the, the U.S. has about 14 and a half trillion in its economy in terms of GDP. Um, China, uh, which 20 years ago just wasn't a factor in the world's economy, has now surpassed Japan this last year to become the second largest economy. They've got between five and a half and six trillion uh, in their economy and growing and growing at a much faster pace than the U.S. Uh, many forecasts that they'll grow faster than eight percent this year, whereas the U.S. is likely to grow at less than three percent growth this year. And so by the year 2020 or thereabouts, it's expected that the Chinese economy will surpass the U.S. economy in terms of size in the world, and that will certainly uh, have an impact on our ability to conduct uh, matters of state, uh, to impact uh, financial changes in the world. But more importantly, right now, China exports a lot of goods to us here in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> and they finance that. They uh, lend to the U.S. government. They've lent close to about a trillion dollars to the U.S. government, so they're really providing vendor financing for us to buy from them. However, that government has adopted a new policy where they're moving from an investment stage in their country, investment in infrastructure, investment in education, uh, to one of consumption. And so they're moving to drive the people in that co country to consume their goods. Mm. And it's expected in the next 20 to 30 years, they'll get to the point to where their population is able to consume most of their production. And therefore, they'll no longer have to export to mm -hmm. the U.S., certainly not like they are today. But most importantly, they will not have to provide that vendor financing to right. us and, and make those loans to the U.S. government. And the U.S. government is then going to have a very difficult challenge ahead to find people willing to finance it if it isn't able to control its uh, spending and its debts. You compared also the United States economy to those other countries who we are starting to um, become very similar to um, Greece, um, Portugal. Um, also, you mentioned that there's a lot of uh, bright spots with the German economy. Um, talk to us a little bit about um, internationally how the relationship between these countries is really we're, we're in, a, in a state really of, of evolving into a new, a, really a new economy globally. Yeah, Germany is, is uh, at this point in time, they, uh, I think a very bright spot in the, in the world economy. Certainly they face their challenges, mm -hmm. um, but they've done a marvelous job since the Berlin Wall went down, uh, dealing with the issues that created for them and uh, building a dynamic economy. Today, their manufacturing and exporting is doing pretty good relative to the rest of the world. Uh, whether or not they can keep it up remains to be seen, but right. I think one thing I give the Germans great credit for is they're able to build a tremendous product of very high quality mm -hmm. uh, that the consumer around the world wants. Uh, when you go into the showroom floor and you look at a Mercedes or an uh, a BMW, uh, you don't haggle over the price, you right. know what you're getting right. and you're willing to pay it. So notwithstanding the fact that the German 
uh, labor costs are much higher here in the U.S., they seem to be putting out a product that people are willing to pay for that quality. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's been missing in the U.S. Uh, despite the fact that our labor costs are, are lower than in Germany, we're just uh, to date not able to compete with them on quality and on a product. And I think uh, American CEOs could take away and, and learn a tremendous lesson from the Germans uh, on this. Looking forward to and how America can address products and, and manufacturing or other um, opportunities to build the economy, um, there's the challenge that, you, that we discussed this morning. A great question is how do we, uh, will there be a new paradigm shift or, or is there one in this country to um, increase excellence in education for the youth of this country that are coming through that will be the future um, engineers or, or designers? Talk to us a little bit about um, some of those topics that you discussed. Yeah, I strongly think that any country's economy is directly tied to the quality of its education. And certainly in the past when the U.S. has had tremendous engineering, science, math schools, uh, schools like MIT, uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Stanford's of the world, if you will, uh, they have turned out unbelievable entrepreneurs that have come up with new products that have, in fact, changed the world we live in and changed our business and literally in the last half a century built the technology industry uh, from what was literally nothing uh, to an industry that in the last few years has either been the largest industry in this country or the, certainly the second largest and so that's a, a, a great example of how American education and ingenuity can work. Mm. Unfortunately today we find ourselves in a situation where our education system probably isn't better, any better than about 20th in the world. And so we see that in terms of uh, the students coming out and the impact on the economy. Right now, we don't have that next new paradigm, and I don't think it's there on the horizon mm -hmm. yet. We have uh, not paid and created a system that gets the best and brightest minds into the classroom as educators. In fact, we've gotten uh, relative to other countries where their systems are very good. A country like Singapore, for example, where the top students are put into the education system carefully nurtured, uh, and then when they come out are compensated at the highest levels amongst professionals. That has generated a phenomenal workforce for Singapore that is um, uh, launching them to be at the forefront of economic growth. The U.S. needs to find a way to do the same thing. We need to find a way with support of parents who quite frankly right. aren't in the classroom enough these days. We need to find a way to go get the best and brightest students, nurture them through college, and then pay them uh, for a job that we expect uh, and, you know, pay them what that's worth to us as a country. And I firmly believe you get what you pay for. Right now, we clearly aren't paying enough vis-a-vis -vis what those countries are doing that are at the top, mm -hmm. and we're suffering for it. Definitely need to pay a higher value or contribute a higher value to the quality of education for the yeah, future. Yeah, we need to have high expectations for our teachers and at the same time we need to compensate them very fairly for that high expectation. Now, um, also to um, another point that you discussed in your presentation was being going coming into a new presidential election campaign and and what we need as a leadership for a country very similar to you said in your presentation Teddy Roosevelt uh, he was a brilliant president what are some of the things that he did that helped in another really difficult time in this US economy that, that we really need to see today yeah I think 
Teddy Roosevelt came in as, as president at a, at a time where he'd almost had uh, a good old boy situation in Washington, D.C. Um, certain special interests had strong control over the legislature uh, at, at times, and it wasn't working for the American public. Uh, things were not being good done for the greater good of the public. They were being done for those special interests. You know, very a lot of similarities to what I think people uh, see going on in this country today. What Roosevelt was able to do, though, was reach out and build a close bond with the American people. He was able to communicate with the American people and get them behind him, notwithstanding the fact that that meant he had to fight a strong Washington establishment. Sure. But because he was able to build that bond with the American public, he was able to get them behind and basically force through the type of legislation and actions that needed to be taken. He was a tough but fair regulator. Uh, he wasn't afraid to take those steps against uh, interests when he thought those interests weren't uh, putting the Americans uh, uh, good first and was had the guts, quite frankly, to turn around and go do that. Mm -hmm. That's not the type of leader that we seem to have on either party's side in Washington, D.C. at this point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it will be interesting to see if in the system that we've developed here, if someone's able to rise uh, above that and really lead again. Mm -hmm very politically neutral presentation which is kind of wonderful we appreciate <laughs> that but delivering news that um, it's tough to take but a hard pill to take to really make that change happen um, we we really appreciate you and is any other comments or, or thoughts you'd like to 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 leave with us and uh, no I very much so enjoyed it again it was a uh, honor to be able to present to this group, a fine group of people in the uh, room. The audience asked some tremendous questions, some mm -hmm. very good questions. I think uh, the audience showed a real understanding of what the issues are, mm -hmm. and uh, I appreciate that. So thank um, you very much for having me. Glad to have you in San Diego, and you're off on a wonderful um, fly fishing excursion. Huh? I'll be on the river in uh, about a day. Good for you. Enjoy. Thank you. And so thank again, you, Brian. honor to have you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.